Welcome back to my channel. It's your girl Lumata Venarine, the one loved and amazingly spoiled by God. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your feedback. I truly appreciate this. And in case you're watching and you've not yet subscribed, please do subscribe, like the video, and share if you think it makes sense. So that's gonna be about the tabernacle mainly because. I think it's very essential to understand how this tabernacle was built and the significance and of each and every material in order to understand why we do certain things today and how important certain practices are. The tabernacle, how did it come into existence and what does that even mean? Let's go back, let's rewind, rewind and go back to the book of Exodus in the book of Exodus chapter 25. I'm just gonna give a recap. So we all know the children of Israel were in Egypt for a period of time, they were slaves, and God sent Moses to go rescue them from there. And they crossed the Red Sea, then they got into the desert, that's the wilderness, and God instructed Moses that, you know what Moses, I want you to build a place where I'm gonna come and meet with you guys. It's gonna be called a dwelling place. So tabernacle simply means dwelling place. And God gave specific instructions on what material to use, the measurements he needs to use, and um, even the colors of the different things he needed to use. And honestly, personally, I was just thinking, God, is it that deep? Why don't you just say build a tabernacle? Like, why don't you just say build a place? You know, why this specification? Does that word even exist? Like, why so detailed and so specific? Because I remember um, Solomon later on, Solomon built a temple for God, for the Lord, and he used like the best materials, like the high quality materials that were available at that time. So I was just thinking to myself, but. God, why give specific instructions of how this tabernacle needs to be built? And after understanding this reality, I just got to understand more about who God truly is. None of his words are said out of boredom. He means each and every word that comes out of his mouth. And that is really amazing. So let's get into more to see how this tabernacle was built and the parallel to what we are experiencing today. Here is a picture of the tabernacle. Tabernacle has been built by many different people because the materials and everything needed to build it was given in the Bible. So if you feel like building a tabernacle, feel free. <laughs> you can find everything in from Exodus 25. The tabernacle has three different sections. So here we see that the tabernacle was made up of the outer courtyard, the holy place, and then the holy of holies. had just one way and that was on the east side so it had just one gate there was no shortcut maybe on the on the left or on the right or maybe on the north south no this one way was called the way yeah you can also see detailed descriptions about the gate in exodus chapter 27 verse 16. So here we see the gate and what happened in front of it. We have the animals who sacrifice, the priest, and the person who brings this offering. This gate represents Jesus. Jesus is the only way to God, right? We don't get into the presence of God by being good citizens, by paying our tax, by giving to orphans and so on of course that's a great thing to do and so on but if you want to be saved if you want to get into the presence of god you need to pass first of all 
through Jesus and Jesus specifically said this in the old in the New Testament sorry he said I am the way and when he said this the Jews were so irritated they were so annoyed I'm just thinking that when Jesus said I am the way they were saying how dare you say you're the way you were just born 30 something years ago in fact you're the son of a carpenter you're Mary's son how can you come and tell us that you are the gate like you are the way to God you're the way into the presence of God like this is blasphemy you know I'm just thinking that that's what they were thinking so here we can see the parallel between the gate in the Old Testament which was the only way into the tabernacle and Jesus who is the way to God anyone who stood out of the tabernacle couldn't see what was going on inside except you were maybe Goliath but no one could see from outside what was going on inside and that is actually how it is today like unless you give your life to Christ unless you accept Jesus unless you pass through that gate you cannot experience the glory of God you cannot really experience the presence of God but on the outside you can just see who he is you can just see like the facts and the details you know okay this gate is red it's it's gold it's this is that the cord is made with white linen and wood okay it, it looks interesting you can just see like the facts about it but you would not have any experience today like when you are a believer when you're born again you experience something different from someone who isn't truly born again the person would just be like okay i know jesus i know god i mean i know all of these things i just see it i've not given my life to christ but that experience is different if you're born again i hope you understand what i mean the fence of the tabernacle was made of white linen and this represents the perfection of jesus and we can see that it's being in between you've got wood the wood that was used was acacia wood this kind of wood does not decay like it is one of the most expensive kinds of wood and it also represents the body of jesus jesus's body did not decay like after he died he resurrected our body your body my body when we die it's gonna decay but this wood represents jesus's body the body that did not see any corruption. Oh, so let's move further. I was remember the people came to give animals to be sacrificed for their sins. So when the priest takes the animals and he opens the gate, once he opens the gate, the first thing he sees is the altar of sacrifice. And what happens there? This animal is going to be killed. And uh, just imagine how bloody it was. Like it was like a butcher's house. Imagine having to kill an animal every time you sin. Oh my God. The altar of sacrifice is a parallel to Jesus' death. For us, we don't need to bring animals anymore to um, for atonement for our sins because Jesus is our sacrifice. That's why he's also referred to as the lamb. Because in those days, people also offered lambs. And lambs were like innocent animals and you needed to transfer your sin onto something that was innocent in order for you to be innocent. That is, you kind of like do an exchange. So... Here we have the parallel. The altar of sacrifice is the cross and sacrifice is Jesus. What does this have to do with us today? The first thing we encounter after giving our lives to Christ, after accepting Jesus into our lives as our Lord and Savior is we encounter the forgiveness of sin. That's why we need to, need to confess your sins. And the first thing that happens is you get forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ and here we see that it's impossible to get into the presence of God without passing through the altar of sacrifice like you couldn't get through from the gate to the holy place talkless of the holy of holies without getting without that sacrifice so we see the parallel between the altar of sacrifice in the Old Testament and Jesus's sacrifice on the cross this altar of sacrifice reveals the power in the blood of Jesus. Now what happens on the altar of sacrifice? Death. Yes, when we give our lives to Christ, we encounter death. We slowly but surely 
kill our flesh because with the flesh in the flesh we can never please God in the flesh we can never get into the presence of God even when you pray in the flesh you don't the glory of God doesn't come down when you sing in the flesh the glory of God is not manifested so so that's why we constantly have to die to ourselves we're dying to our flesh and when we say dying it's not physical death it's not like you go and die but um, your desires the desires that do not glorify God like if there are things you like to do that do not glorify God that are sinful that um, lead you to sin by stopping to do that you're dying to your flesh you're saying no to your flesh so it's not a physical death but this death is manifested in every decision we make right morning to night probably you can die many times to yourself the flesh and the spirit are, <clears throat> are enemies imagine like i'm sure many of you can relate but sometimes when you want to pray there's just this rain or sleep the sleep is so sweet like you just want to sleep this it's just like your eyes would can't even stand any second open but as soon as you just stop praying you're so awake like you just feel like, okay i can watch this movie i can go on instagram i can do this i can do that so we can see that the body and the spirit let me say that the flesh and the spirit are enemies so we constantly have to kill the flesh die to ourselves it's impossible to please god in the flesh because left to your flesh you wouldn't even follow Christ. Left to your flesh, you would never find time to pray. Left to your flesh, you would never um, do good. You would not even love people. You would pay evil for evil. Like left to your flesh, you would never really be a true child of God. We see that on the altar of sacrifice, there's a lot of surrender. This is where surrender takes place. From here, we move on to the laver. The laver was a bowl and in this bowl there was water in it god instructed moses to use the mirrors of the women of israel to make the outer part of this labor during the time they were doing all these sacrifices in the old testament you need to know that the priests they had um, a specific robe they had to wear their attire their costume and they were barefooted yeah so after doing all this bloody sacrifice they need to move on to the labor to wash their hands and wash their feet and then from there they get into the holy place but before that we're going to look at the laver so the laver had water in it right and this signifies the word of god after accepting christ after being forgiven after constantly killing your flesh like you don't kill your flesh once every day you die to yourself every day through your decisions you die that's the process of dying yeah so after killing your flesh after being forgiven what do you do you need to renew your mind with the word of god we can see this in Romans 12 verse 2. He says, renew your mind daily so you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I think many of us end at the forgiving stage. You know, sometimes some of us give our lives to Christ or we say we are Christians. We've experienced the forgiveness of God, but our word life is almost not existent like we do not read the word of god and that's a trick of the enemy because without the word of god you can never like fully please god and you're also ignorant of who you are of what you can do of what god expects of you the old testament remember you have the gate after you enter the gate you have the altar of sacrifice after doing the sacrifice you need to wash your hands well not you but the priest the priest washed washes his hands and his legs with the water and even remember the labor was made with a mirror so he could see his legs okay the labor was made with many he could see his legs and um james also mentions this he says the word of god is like a mirror so through the word of god you can see your true identity through the word of god you see what you can change like if you read today about forgiveness and you're like oh my god i have this person still in my heart i haven't forgiven this person you go back and you forgive the person or the word of god talks about um caring for the poor and you're just like oh my god like when last did i help someone when last did I? and you know the word of god is like a mirror it's where we look ourselves at and we try to change so the word of god 
yet it's not for us to read and be like mm, this word is for sandra i mean um Nathaniel has to change that this word. No, you're reading the word of God for yourself. Okay, God can give you a word for someone else, but the word of God is primarily for yourself. And many people do substitute reading the word of God by prayer, but that's not how it's done. Like the word of God comes hand in hand with prayer. It's better to do 50 50 than just do one and leave the other one. So we see the lever the lever which is a symbol for the word that empowers that renews us that fills us with the power and the presence of God so once the word of God fills us um, controls us we are transformed and this transformation occurs because we know the truth and this enables us to get into the holy place in the next video we'll talk about the holy place and the holy of holies let's do a recap so the tabernacle in those days was a physical place like it was like a tent that the children of god always carried with themselves because you know they didn't stay on one place for a long period of time they were constantly moving to their destination which was the promised land so but today you and i we are the tabernacle the we are this dwelling place of God and how is that through the Spirit of God the Holy Spirit is the presence of God it is God himself Christ also says like we are the church like we all are the church the church is not a building the church is you and me and that's why said the Bible is also very keen on letting us to know that we shouldn't defy this body said there are many other aspects like the colors what they symbolize the pillars and so on and so forth but I think for a beginning I don't want to pump a lot of information into this video please do like this video please share it to as many people as possible and please subscribe you can find that down below in the red box and um, remember to click on the bell notification bell and until next time stay care